Thank you, Manny. So we've been talking about operational efficiency and we've been working up to this, this particular webinar. So the title is Designing an Executive's Quality Management System. And, and what I wanna talk about is, is what is different between what an executive does in quality and what we do in the shop floor in, in what I call Gembo One quality. So as I look at this, what we're gonna talk about is, is basically uh, what are the concepts and principles in all of these prior lectures and how they define the elements of a comprehensive company-wide systematic architecture for design of an executive-driven TQM system. Now you can call it business excellence if you want to, uh, I don't care. We're not talking about ISO 9000 and daily management here. We're talking about the executive components. When we take a look at this, I've talked before about Gemba 1 and Gemba 2. So Gemba 1 is the operational production, fu production function. Gemba 2 is a strategic productive function. So in Gemba 2, managers are managing what we call resource efficiency. And, and what they are, are trying to do is assure value adding flow efficiency of the business. And at the worker level in Gemba 1, they're managing flow efficiency. That's the flow of either information or materials. And they're working on providing value adding work throughput in terms of the deliverables, which may be a service or a product. And what we see is that there's a negotiation process happening between the two. And this negotiation process is about how do we get overall efficiency for the organization? Do we have the resources we need when we need them? And does the work actually flow the way we need it to compared to the demand from customers? Now, when we look at these organizations, we see that the, there's two things we'll come and we'll, we'll come back and talk to you about. We talk about uh, standardized do check act and plan do check act. Those are basically Gemba 1, Gemba 2 processes. Deming talked about plan do study act, and that's a Gemba 3 process. And what's happening we see is that there's really three things that we're trying to accomplish. In Gemba 1 with the frontline workers, we're basically focusing on uh, reflective action, what can we do better, that's what Kaizen is all about, and then action management, doing the work that we're planning to doing. In Gemba uh, 3, the senior management is spending most of their time on reflective leadership, trying to figure out where we need to go, what resources we need to have, how will we apply them, how do we prioritize them, and they also then have sort of a reflective action, sort of an improvement function, and then they have a very minor standard work function. And in the middle management, we're sort of balanced between the three. So what we see is that we want the organization to think ahead. And if you, you go back in history, when we take a look at, at the very first writings about new economic principles or the economic principles of today, we see in Adam Smith in his Wealth of Nations, he talked about two categories. There was the planners and the doers. And, and so the planners was the management function and the doers was the worker function. And so we see the two of these together and in between we have the buffer, which is what we call middle management. Now, as we're looking at this quality system, we see there are really three levels in how we have a quality improvement mindset. So the leaders are responsible for the culture. How does everyone work together in a rational way to assure quality for the, the customer? Managers are delegating responsibility for quality through a, a set of consistent actions to enable the flow of work and encourage worse, workers to take personal responsibility for the quality of their work. And the workers then accept that personal responsibility for achieving quality outcomes, and they take ownership of their standard work process that achieves that result consistently. So we see all aspects of the quality system must be working together in a collaborative way. We notice that this was in Japan called the output of WA or harmony about the way it's working. So we're not fighting across the levels of the organization or across the different functions in the organization. So normal work follows a do check cycle. So we, we saw that we see normal work, we have standardized do check act, and, and we build this up by, we, we say make rule, teach rule, that's the standardizing, and that's what we call shitsuke, it's about education and motivation. And then in the everyday work, we see we start off Sirdi Sitan, prepare the work, get everything at hand, and now we're keeping the rule. And CISO is about how we do consistent improvements of cycles through the process of cleaning up. And so we're cleaning up waste in the process and eliminating waste in all dimensions, and it keeps getting deeper 
the more we iterate that process. And here we're checking the rule. And what we see is that routine operations are basically do check. As long as there's nothing wrong in the process, we've done everything we can, we're gonna be um, moving back and forth between those two steps. However, if there's an out of control situation, then we have to come back and examine it. And this is what Siketsu is all about. You can consider Siketsu a, a total productive maintenance equivalent to what we call in TPM or in TQM, Kaizen. So this is about how do we change the rule to make it work? And then we go back and then we go into the process and make the rule and teach the rule. So this is what's happening in that daily management system. So what we see is that process quality assurance is really happening in this check step. And so we're assigning rules and this is how we create standard work. So standard work is basically a rule-based system, a series of checklists, forms, and so forth, that tells us how we should be doing our work, if you will, the one best way. Now, managing work maintenance and change, uh, it's about what we call shigato, which means true work or employment, it's a job. And it refers to work that adds value in production. So we see in the standardized JUCAC check act, the job of maintenance and continual improvement is to increase value to the level that's been designed into the work process. And in the, the Plan to Check Act, we see that the job of managing change projects will increase value adding capability of the routine work operations. So PDCA is basically planned on improving SDCA or the Gemba One daily work. And, and this is exactly the model that is in the Japanese standard, JSQC standard, guidelines for daily management, which was issued last in, in 2014. Now, if we take a look at this, I've superimposed on that Deming cycle. So we see Gemba 1, the SDCA cycle, Gemba 2, the PDCA cycle, and then we have transformation management. So if we take a look at, at Deming's book, The New Economics, where he introduces PDSA, he talks about it in the context of leadership transforming change. And so what we are actually seeing is that when the front line, uh, Gemba 1, Gemba 2, are doing check, management is looking over their shoulder to say, how do we actually achieve the purposeful outcome or objective of improvement? And they are studying the situation. This is what reflection is all about in that process. And so the idea is we're reflecting and saying, what do we need to do to help Gemba 1 get better? And then what projects do we need to launch in Gemba 2 that will provide the resources and competence to Gemba 1 to do the job that we need in the future? And so these are the cycles of improvement that are happening and they're overlapping as we go through this work. So as we look at this, we see that we have these three Gemba. Gemba one is the work process level. It's focusing on continual improvement and it's looking at value delivery. Gemba two is looking at breakthrough. A lot of new technologies coming in. We see this now today with what we call quality 4.0, but this is an emphasis on the business areas. And Gemba three is looking out towards the future. This is about transforming the organization, and it's about the governance level. So how do we apply the organization's resources to take us to the future? And if we look at all of those, that's what implementing continuous states of structural change is all about. That's continuous improvement, is doing it all. So continuous improvement is not the Gamba One process, that's continual. It's got a fixed process. In other words, it needs to have a reflection step. So in reality, across these three levels, there's actually a portfolio of projects that drive the change. And so we see that the emphasis of the leader is on improving the systems, whereas the managers improve the work processes and workers improve the tasks that are going on. So each of those is a necessary improvement uh, capability, and the system is only sufficient for improvement when all of them are coordinated and, and working in, in synchronization. So we see in these, these Gembas, we have, uh, there's a different focus on different things. So we see the process doer, value-adding tasks. The facilitator, coordination of flow. That's like the supervisor. Process owner is assuring control of that. And then the system owner is about developing the systems for the future. And so we can see each of those has particular work areas that they focus on. So as we say, everybody has responsibility for quality we see that that responsibility will actually differ based on the job and the level in the organization we have. So every worker then has a unique job to do that will contribute 
to the overall system level quality in what we talk about TQM or total quality management. So the total means everyone's participating, everyone is acting, everyone has a job to do, everyone uses methodology and tools, but they are all appropriate for their job and their level in the organization. So it's not a cookie cutter system where you take one set of tools and everybody uses the same tools. And so as we look at these three Gemba, we see the customer focus in Gemba 1 is the next step in the process. The customer focus in Gemba 2 is the external customer. And the customer focus in Gemba 3 is the owners or the externalities of the organization. And each of these has a different work objectives, dominant types of functions. Uh, they have a performance function that's different, and they have a different way of, of quantifying that performance and their mindset, if you will, the mantra that they have is, is very different. So right the first time is Gemba 1. Serve the customer is Gemba 2. Get business results is Gemba 3. And we see all of them use a, a, a team approach, but the teams are different. And so we also saw, as we had before, improvement is the focus in Gemba 1, breakthrough in Gemba 2, and transformation in Gemba 3. So we see at every one of those levels, there's a change in focus and content. So the workers have to have their own distinct way to understand how do we align this work and these tasks so we get the right results and it's all coordinated and synchronized. Well, we see that there is basically value deployment through Hoshin Conry. So, so the purpose of an organization is to deliver value to customers. Uh, Peter Drucker said the purpose of every organization is to create a customer. So, it achieves this outcome through how it designs its deliverables and its system of production. And, and what Hoshin Connery is trying to do is assure quality through design and delivery of value in three major ways. So one is there has to be a comprehensive listening system that identifies the issues to address which frontline workers cannot improve. So what frontline workers can improve, they should be free to improve. However, management at the top level, whether it's the middle management or the executive, needs to have a listening system so they can understand what can we give them to help them get through that process. There also has to be a cross-organizational process of dialogue. So how do we get consensus about what's important for direction, objectives, change projects, targets, and the resources required? And then finally, we have to have a project management system that allows us to make those cross-functional, cross-organizational, cross-level changes so we get an increased capability in the value delivery process for the organization. So all of this is what we're trying to do in, in Hoshin because it's all about maximizing value across the whole organization. So we start seeing that the responsibilities of the governance Gemba, this is Gemba 3, this is the executive function, so they have to study and evaluate the business system implications based on the externalities happening. In Gemba 1, we're looking at mostly internalities, and, and yes, I will include our suppliers in that as well, because that's an extended part of how we specify the work and choose them. But, but in Gemba 3, we're worrying about what's happening from the outside world. And we also have to establish where are we going? What's the strategic direction? And we have to craft a corporate function that allows us to have this collaborative work. You know, can we actually see the situation we're in, understand the issues, and then take the right actions? So resources come down from, from the board level or the external shareholders and so forth. They come through the executive function, and then they need to be allocated to projects or by budget to particular activities. We also see that decision rights come down. So who gets to make what decision, at what level, and, and how much authority do they have to change things in the company? Uh, we also would like to see balance of life. That's a very important thing in work. And that also has to be a concern of the executive level. So, so it, it, we need to think, how do we keep our lives balanced for our workers so they're not totally consumed in what they do every day? And I think this is perhaps now one of the most important things in, we've seen in this COVID time is that many people get on to burnout because how do I manage my life when I'm working out of my house, I live out of my house, my children, my cats, and my wife all require things during the day when I'm here because they see me and they don't understand the situation that I need to be working. Um, Gamba 3 also needs to bring in investment funds to accomplish the things that we need for the future of the organization. And then they have to communicate with the owners and, and the public 
uh, whether it's the, the shareholders, the stock analysts, or the government, about the corporate activities. And then they have to recommend the governance party uh, policy to the governing body for approvals. So that would be like making recommendations to the board of directors. And so they will also then participate in those company-wide improvement projects. If we're trying to do something for the whole company, we need to have the executive in charge be a role model in terms of what we're seeing for the future. So basically, Gamba 3 sets a strategy and provides the resources for everything we do in that organization. Now, we, we can take a look at this as uh, what's called triple loop learning. And so we see that if we take a look starting at the process action, when we do a process working in Gamba 1, we get results. That's a Gamba 1 decision. Is it right? So single loop learning is, are we doing the right things? If we're not, it's problem solving. So this is where we spend a lot of time in our organizations. Double loop learning is asking a different question. Are we doing the right things? Have we gotten all the projects we need to? So this is talking about how we operate our processes and how we design them. So there we're not learning about the process. We're actually learning about, do the processes deliver the business? And in Gamba 3, the triple loop uh, learning, uh, what we're seeing is it's about the strategic content. How do we decide what's right? How do we get the time frame? How do we get the synchronization of this? How do we get the interaction effects of all the different projects? So we have a coherent approach. And then how do we blend together the technical systems and the human systems? And that's why we have to have this cultural emphasis in that whole process. So each Gemba is actually a learning environment. And we see we'll have lessons learned from the organization at all three of those levels. So Gemba 3, for the executive, it's mainly about Mori waste. If we make decisions that are bad at the executive level, when we depress them into the organization or we deploy them into the organization, they will then affect the cross-functional situation. That can create bad flow, okay? And if that comes down to the workers and the workers have to deal with the bad flow, they have extra work to do, that creates muda. And this is a situation where those workers cannot fix it because they're responding to the executive decision mandate that came down, you have to do this. And then their boss said, you have to balance this out. And even though it doesn't really flow in real world, they have to work extra to get it done. And so we see perhaps the worst kind of waste is morty waste by the executives. And I know I can point out a number of examples where we see that uh, executives in charge of organizations have made bad financial decisions about how they will do investments. Yeah, and I, I, I've used, I think, one case from AT&T after they had divestiture in 1984 and they tried to find their way forward. They actually spent almost $200 billion in the next 20 years to try to find their way forward. And at the end, there's over 70 billion of that lost to shareholders because they made poor decisions. And so uh, what was amazing to me was at the end of that, it was still considered a blue chip stock. Now, if you, if you put it in, in that context, most of us would say, why would I invest in that? Because it's actually losing the shareholder value. So what we see then is, is we have a layered system. The business system is in the context of this organizational quality culture. How do we all work together? And, and the business system is what's happening at the executive level. So we're doing business assessments, strategic benchmarking, performance management, operational benchmarking. This is all the strategic management function, and we're converting it into systems engineering. These are the projects we're going to use to change the system. And they cut deployed down into cross-functional management. So if those are the big projects that we need to do, who is going to take what responsibility for each one in those functional areas? So we have to then sort of divide those activities by the functions. And then we have what, what many people have, have seen as an X matrix, uh, that's only one style you can do Ocean Tenkai, but that's policy deployment. And so we take the policy and then we say, okay, how do we participate? And, and that's the, the catch ball and negotiation process going on where we use quality methods, tools, and activities and, and the fundamental measurement system. And that's where we actually are getting the activities uh, performed in Gemba 1. So this is basically the mental model uh, of a complete quality system that we see uh, around these types of organizations. Now, a planning model of that same thing looks something like this. Now, I don't have Gemba 3 quite called out on this, but 
GEMBA 3 is up in that upper level someplace. It changes with each organization. But GEMBA 1 is a productive function. It's, it's down in the work. So we're implementing strategy. Those are strategic projects that come down. We're changing them into daily management, and then they're doing the strategic strategy monitor. You know, how are those change projects and our daily work? How are they actually performing? GEMBA 2 is about creating the long-term strategic functions of the organization. So we have strategy assessment. So you might think of this as something like um, a business excellence checklist or, or the Baldrige criteria or something like this. We also take a look at the daily management system, our capacity planning for the future, the resources we have. And from this, we get our set of challenges. And then we go into strategy search. Strategy search is all about trying to say, what alternatives do we have to deal with this set of challenges that we have? And from this, we can take a look at the opportunities we have and also our vulnerabilities. And many people think of this very simplistically as a SWOT uh, analysis, and we're going to see that that's actually far from what's really happening. And then we go into strategy formulation. So strategy formulation is where we choose those projects that will change the organization. And, and my friend Hiroshi Osada, who, who uh, is referenced here below, and he wrote, wrote this paper about strategic management by policy and TQM, which is what the Japanese do today, uh, he, he has said that strategy formulation is the weakest part of a whole Ocean Connery system. So, so we want to pay particular attention to what's happening in strategy formulation. So this is strategic management by policy. It's all this area up here that's happening in Gemba 2. Now, when we look at this, we see actually if we have performance by change over time in months, we start seeing really there's two components. One component, which is uh, daily management, we see that we can get this performance by the current activities, and, and this is not achievable by the current activities. And so we see this is what we can do. So, so it's not a big stretch. You might call this the easy hanging fruit or low hanging fruit. But this up here is what we need to do. If we want to get to the committed target at a financial year or any other period of time, we say we have to do something different. And the thing we have to do different is that change activity that we need to plan. And that's what the Hoshans are all about. They're taking us to a new level of performance. Very similar when we talk about a design for Six Sigma. And, and what design for Six Sigma is actually designing a system or a series of production processes so that it's able to perform at a higher level than it has in the past. So we see that this is the gap that needs to be closed. What we can do with our current performance plus some level of incremental performance and that this target that we'd really like to get to. Uh, when I worked at HP, John Young coined the phrase, the stretch objective. And, and what that means is not to stretch the employees as far until they break, but it meant, can we do more with the technologies we haven't actually implemented but are available to us? And can we learn from other people not to report, repeat their mistakes so we can get it done more quickly. So this is, is the kind of gap we would like to close. Now, the first thing we have to do is really understand the current situation. So Einstein said the important thing is not to stop questioning. So we start with an inquiry. We don't assume what the situation is. We go look at it. We determine that current state by looking at the results. What is it actually performing? That's in Six Sigma, that's the why we look at. We establish a maturity goal to achieve. How good could we be doing? So we take a look at process capability statistics. We see CPK is what we actually are doing on average. CP is what it was designed to do if the system was operating ideally at the center of the specification. Now, we need to drill down to discover where are the embedded weaknesses. If our Y measure is not performing right, we have to go into the process steps, look at it the sequentially way, and find out where is weakness occurring and where do we have the loss functions. Then we have to abandon the old ways of work that don't really work, and this is requiring innovation, a new way of looking at things that does things in a different way, but achieves the objectives. And then we have to eliminate the waste that's rooted inside our processes. Again, I, I tell managers, don't rely on the seven ways of Toyota. Name your own waste. Make sure everybody in your organization understands what that waste is. The waste that the Toyota system created came out of the, the 1950s from workers who were actually working in 
by and large, a highly mechanical uh, organization. Today, we have knowledge-based organizations. And not all of those waste categories are highly meaningful to people. And so we have to create meaningful names, meaningful operational definitions, and examples so workers can actually see, oh, that's what you mean by a waste or a loss. Because many times what we see as a waste is actually something that they find as their normal way of doing things. And then we have to create a pathway for improving results. So this is what we would like to get out of that quality system. Now, the way we put it together, this SMBP process, Strategic Management by Policy, we see it's going to be a structured scientific approach for coordinating operational resources to achieve the long-term delivery. So we see there's education on, on quality management. We see that they are using small group activities for daily management with evolutionary change. And then there's also small groups activities for policy management. These are the projects that we're doing. So these would be like a Hoshin, Kaizen, uh, Hoshin or Kaizen Conry type of project. So Con a Conry project is done within a function. Hoshin projects are done cross-functionally for the all organization. Those give us breakthrough changes and in innovation. And out of this, we get the business plan. So the SDCA cycle combined with the PDCA cycle drives the business plan in the organization. So all three of those has to be integrated. When we initiated Hoshin Conry and Hewlett Packard in 1984-85, we had a business planning process called the 10-step process. And that was very similar to what this SMBP is about. And it said, this is where we want to go in the future as an organization. The way we get there is we're going to choose these projects as the Hoshin management system, and we will deploy them through the Hoshin Tenkai. So all of that is done there. Now, there's a very big question. You know, what is Hoshin Tenkai? People haven't heard about it. So we see that, that this is, is what it is in Japan. And, and it's translated as policy. It's really a bad idea to translate policy. But when the word policy was, was introduced to the Japanese language, it was done by Dr. Duran in 1964. And there was no word for policy. And so what they did was they started describing really a plan of action that we would call it in the West. And so when, when they talk about what they're doing, it's an action plan. But if we take a look, what's in that? It's, it's a slogan. These are the round words to motivate the employees. So we're going to kill you know, uh, our co competition. Then the issue, what's the operational definition of what we're trying to achieve? The end, what's the final state we want to achieve? The means, these are the things that we'll do to change our way of working to get to that end state. The target is how much we're going to get there or the milestones we achieve. Schedule is a timeline along which we do it, and responsibility saying who is doing what, when, and who's leading the action. If you take a look at it, that's very similar to what is in a uh, Lean Six Sigma uh, uh, project charter. So basically, when we're talking about policy in, in this Hoshin Connery process, it's really the equivalent of a strategic plan. And, and all of those, those projects actually go up and they're reported uh, to management for review along with their daily management system reviews. So we see we have these three things, strategy assessment, search, and formulation. And managerial engineering is actually uh, 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 deriving choices for strategic products. So we see part of this is we have this core in, internal analysis going on. So we have performance audit. So that's what's happening in our processes. Business performance indicators, what's happening in our deliverables of the business. And this gives us internal operational benchmarks. We then compare these externally. So we'll do strategic benchmarks against competition, similar industries, and we'll also do a technology assessment. So we have internal assessment plus external assessment. And this is going to be then modified by critical assumptions about our business or about technologies of the future or about how the future will change and the constraints we have on our organization based on our business model. Those go into the strategic decision criteria. This is that Hoshin Conry meeting of the management team. And out of that come the strategic change projects or the portfolio of change projects. So this is that logic, if you will, in terms of how we do this managerial engineering to choose the Hoshin projects. So the Hoshin projects are created in that yellow box there. And what we see is we're going to cascade this down into the organization. So this is what we call catchball. So we have an objective, and that's what we need to achieve. The means are the things we're going to do to achieve it. 
and then we will deploy those into the next level of the organization and they'll get their objectives and have to create their means and so forth as we go down. So as we go down this structure, we're deploying the objectives of management. So that is the Hoshan objectives. When we're coming it back up in the check function or the study function, that's how we integrate across there. So, so this coordination is occurring across functional levels and across the functions. So this is how we, we uh, achieve, if you will, this collaborative working process in, in the Hoshan system. Now, there's three important roles in this. And so one is uh, the role of the facilitator, another is the role of the content provider, and the third is the role of the decision maker. So I'd like to talk about each of those. And, and basically, if we have a talented team doing these diverse roles and they have shared objectives, we can have actually a sound strategic system that will give us a high probability of future success. So the strategy content provider. So we start seeing that, that these are the activities that they have. And so uh, they are basically the role of the chief strategy officer. So one is an architect. And so they're trying to figure out, you know, how do we spot industry shifts and, and standing competitive advantages? That's basically using the Michael Porter five forces for industry positioning. Another is uh, a motivator. So this is building capabilities and, and delivering special projects to uh, develop a higher organizational IQ. And you might think of this as increasing profound knowledge in the organization. So those might be technology studies or other things about what we need to do. These people are visionary, so they have to forecast trends, disruptions, shocks to the system. And they also have to be a surveyor. Where, where do we see disruptions and how do we give advice over long-term threats and opportunities that will come out of those disruptions? And then finally, they have to be a portfolio manager. So how do we improve performance by reallocating resources and optimizing these corporate uh, uh, portfolios and all the change projects that are happening at each level? So here we're concentrating on developing scenarios and the content included in the strategy assessment and in monitoring uh, competitive positions in technologies, markets, uh, as well as competitive analysis. And we have to also think about how we're going to have the process of designing, developing, deploying strategy. So, so these are all about assessment, analysis, decision-making, and execution. Now, there's a second role, and this is a role that, that I like to see uh, the quality function doing. So, so it can be the chief quality officer or it could be a master black belt, but they are leading the staff process for strategy assessment. So when we're going out to understand what is our current state, maybe they're aiding in benchmarking studies or facilitating the leadership assessments. Strategy search, they're coordinating the staff, uh, the staff process to look for what are the issues and opportunities we can use to address those weaknesses we see. Uh, strategy formulation, uh, we're facilitating the executive workout. So um, General Electric introduced the concept of a workout as a way to deal with these things. Basically, that's what happens in a Hoshan Conry system. We do all the staff work, we bring it to a meeting, and we, we work through that to come up with what are the, the number of projects that are manageable across the organization with the resources we have to get us where we want to be. So, so when, when I've done this in some organizations, that's maybe three consecutive days of the executive team's time, but it's been set up by a lot of completed staff work by the functions, including this strategy process facilitator. And in the end, strategy monitor is, is saying, okay, we need to do project reviews. We have to, to have a liaison to the people who are managing the projects. We have to check those and so forth. And that's another type of role that, that can be had here. So it's concentrating on process of designing, developing, and deploying strategy. This is the assessment, analysis, decision-making, and execution. Finally, we come to the role of the chief executive for strategy. And these comments come from Herbert Simon's 1949 book on administrative behavior. And he said basically that we have sort of a system of constraints. So we understand, um, we have to understand what are the limitations of the CEO and the boundary conditions that they face when making a rational choice. And so one is their scope con constraint. So, so, so executives need to have a clearly presented data that truthfully reflects the situation and its ramifications with respect to what they want to do in the future. There are also knowledge constraints. Can those executives read and interpret the information presented 
and, and do they have confidence in the advisors who are providing this information? This is very important in the world of big data. It's about information integrity. So it's not about cleaning data up. It's actually making sure we have the right data and it's telling us the right things. And then con time constraints. So what's the sense of urgency? How fast do we have to make a decision? Now, if we have to make a long-term decision today, we're probably going to be making a lot of errors because we make it with the information we have on hand, even if we're uncomfortable with it. So the decision-making process must be structured so we generate alternatives and that the executives have enough data to understand what's going on. So this is when we talk about predictive analytics that needs to be supporting there. So here, we're concentrating on the process of balancing all of the organizational constituencies into choosing the most appropriate rational choice as their strategic intent. This is where we're going, and that's why we're going to invest in these future activities. And as we look at this thing, we see that everyone's job is really to encourage goodness, Kaizen, and prevent badness, Kayaku. So, so let's not do things that will create wrongness. And we see that all of these organizations work in teams, whether it's a cross-functional team like a council at an executive level, it's a project team like um, uh, an improvement project that is, is a Hoshin project in the management level, or it's quality circles where we have work doing in, in the, 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 uh, the basic Gemba. So the resources of this whole system need to be allocated so we get control of quality, safety, flow, and, and motivation in that whole process. So everyone has a function, and each of them has a different type of waste they focus on, and they have a different objective. So the executive level, it's about agility, and they use policy. So can we actually uh, follow the business of the future and be prepared for the states we need to have? Harmony at the second level and flow, it's about moral waste. Can we actually work in harmony across the functions and across the, the different uh, levels of, of product age, for instance, you know, in terms of the uh, product line management processes uh, to deliver value to the customers. And at the worker level, it's about discipline. You know, are we following the disciplines of standing work? Are we seeking perfection in what we deliver to customers? And here we're focusing on MUDA. So each of those has a different focus and, and system. And so we're looking at the quality system. Basically, it says we have to have sort of three different levels of quality system. One is working on this, if you will, operational excellence. This is the value-based links in Gemba 1. The second one is in the Gemba 2. How do we manage this, this benchmark or these improvement projects? So we, we need to do benchmarking, understand what's available out there, self-assessment, what are we doing wrong, and then through a series of projects, incrementally improve the business towards the target we have. At the executive level, we have to understand how do we allocate our resources to get to our aspiration level? These are the goals or objectives we have in the future. And so that's about the strategic linkages that drive business excellence. And so we saw uh, this language that many organizations use today, OPEX and business excellence, that each of them has a different concentration in how they're supposed to work together. So in this system, everyone has a unique quality responsibility. They're responsible for quality in their own way. So workers for improving the quality of their own work. Supervisors responsible for improving the quality of the end-to-end -end workflows. Functional managers are responsible for cross-functional integration of the collaborative work environment. Executives are responsible for assuring resources have been allocated properly, and the executive in charge must have an unrelenting intent to pursue improvements of all kinds at all of those levels. And so we have to accept responsibility for self-management. When, when Peter Drucker was talking about management by objectives in 1956 in his uh, practice of management, he said it's management by objectives and self-control. Those words were brought into the Japanese planning systems, and self-control became a very important watchword. If we take a look at what happened to MBO in the West, there was no self-control. It was only MBO. And I believe that was one of the major weaknesses of trying to implement this MBO as the strategy in Western organizations, and also why the Hoshin systems of Japan had done so well. Now, if we look at Michael Porter's five forces model, we see when we look at this, you know, he had uh, two things happening. We had threat of new entrants, threat of substitute products, and then we had the bargaining powers of suppliers versus the bargaining powers of the customer base 
And, and within this, we're saying, okay, what's happening with this rivalry with us as we do head-to-head -head competitive analysis uh, with our competition? But this is actually focusing on positioning within the industry, but it's not necessarily moving into new ventures or how we develop capabilities or competencies for the future. It's, it's basically trying to understand what are the moves happening within our industry. But if we take a look at this, it doesn't tell us which of our internal processes do we need to fix. And so this is the big difference between what we see with the five forces model. It doesn't get into the operational reality. Whereas the S7 toolkit for strategy formulation, it does the five forces activities, but it also then allocates the strategic processes with the data that they need to have, with the resources they need to have to get to those objectives at the end. So they have these seven different types of analyses that are done. So environmental analysis, you may think of that as PEST. Product analysis, so benchmarking products against competitors, that's like competitor product analysis. Market analysis, yeah, we do that. Product to market analysis, so mapping company versus the, the competitors and find out what's the relative positioning in each of the different markets. Product portfolio analysis, what is the strength of our portfolio and how do we, we develop that portfolio for alternative markets? Strategic elements analysis, now we're getting into what are the things we need to do to affect quality, price, the service, and the business issues. And then finally, resource allocation is how do we apply the resources to get through this collection of projects? And this is what, what we, goes into that strategy search uh, type of function. Now, strategy formulation is still going to be the act of management. But we have a couple of things we need to look out for. So one is the black swan effect. This is a highly exaggerated effect that comes from a, a, a very improbable event. And when this is defined on top of a wicked problem, and we see a wicked problem is one where the problem statement itself is elusive. We can't define it. It creates a divisive response, and it confuses people in terms of direction. So we have to be aware that there are these high impact, low probability events that when they happen, they make a big difference. That's like a tsunami hitting Japan uh, it is a black swan type of event. But in hindsight, we could say, yeah, we should have known it was coming, but we didn't know it was coming then or do anything to prepare about it. Second thing is, is Gemba knowledge. This is process-based inquiry that we conduct to gain personal knowledge of what's going on. This is what Genichi uh, Gembutsu, or, or go to the Gemba, go see for yourself, is what Taichi Ono said. And what this means is that the executives need to go and talk to the workers, not to, to give them advice on how to do their work, but to find out what can we do to make your work better. So it's a request for action from them. Do you need more resources? Do you need training? You know, is there something wrong with the technologies that we need to fix? And to get their input into the strategy. So that's a very important part. When I take a look at a lot of these gamble walks, it's more just industrial tourism. Okay, I'm going down to the, the shop floor. I'm going to take off my jacket, maybe take off my ties, roll up my sleeves, walk, walk down there. They can see I'm here, and it's like face time for the workers. But that's not what it is in Japan. And we also see when we communicate, we have to worry about zones of indifference. So how we communicate orders or give the strategic direction does it happen in a way that conflicts with the personal moral code of the workers? And do we give that direction in a clear manner so the workers can see how that benefit actually derives to their own situation? So, so you know, what's in it for me is what some people will talk about here. So what's in it for me if I do this? How will I benefit from this? I understand how the workers, uh, the, the organization is going to fit. It's going to make a lot of money, but what do I get out of it? And we have to get to that personal level so people can understand that they actually get a benefit out of these types of things. And we can also see that when we have this Hoshin Conry system, a number of communication tools can be employed. So we can use communication plans. We can use focus groups among employees or customers. We can do stakeholder analysis and find out who have vested interest in the organization. What do we need to do? We can take a look at force field analysis and say, what are the different strengths of or, or weaknesses of the positions we have? Who's for them? Who's against them? What are they helping and hindering forces? We also see there's this negotiation process. How do we have this dialogue moving up and down uh, in this sort of cascaded catchball 
and how do we get participation in this so we actually get a consensus-based collaborative decision-making process. We can also have what I call strategic dialogue white papers. Uh, so, so this is when, when management says these are the focus areas for strategy formulation, and let's say we come up with seven focus areas, do we actually have like a Wikipedia white paper on each of those that people can contribute their ideas to? So we actually are collecting the focused ideas of people about how we make those change happen. And then finally, at the end of the day, how do we get clarity with people about what our direction is going to be? And this is the idea of an elevator speech. How do we summarize that strategic intent and the rationale so people understand what we're trying to do? So communication strategy is much too important to be left to chance. I remember when I was at HP uh, in the corporate quality office, they actually had a communication manager whose job was to communicate about quality, process, and these sorts of things. So it was not an external communication focus, it was for the workers. It was not about HR type of communication about benefits, news, and so forth. It was about the things that matter in terms of how we improve work. Now, across these three Gemba, we see that there are certain things that can help link and align the organization. And so these are our management system ingredients that create this collaboration in a vertical dimension. So one is a shared vision of strategic direction. Everybody sees where we're going. There's an integrated performance management system. So at the top level of the organization, we look down and we can see how the strategy is deployed. At the front line, we can take a look at our measures and then we look up and we see how we are actually affecting the long-term strategy. There's gotta be a standardized risk management system. And so this is gonna become, I think, more important as we go through. Uh, it, it's now being reflected a little bit in ISO 9000 with risk-based thinking, but that's insufficient. Uh, and so we, we have to start understanding more about risk and how we manage this. Also, we need a common approach to process management. If we want processes to be integrated in the organization, we have to have a common way to map those, measure them, name them, and talk about how they integrate. So a singular tool for process mapping, a singular measurement system that gives you Y as a function of X connectivity across those measures. And then we have to have this collective core function, uh, cultural function of the organization. So the foundation is the same. So people have the same beliefs and feeling about those things that are most important principles or guidelines for the organization. And then there needs to be this consistent approach to continual improvement. Once we have all of those things, we've actually connected all of the methodologies we have. Now in Japan, uh, Noshinobu, uh, Nayatani uh, created a, 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 a team that 1976 wrote in Japanese and it was translated in English in 1994, the seven QC tools. So these were called the seven management tools or seven MP tools. And, and what these methods do is they enable integrated thinking, task coordination, team scheduling. And that's really what they're all about. Now, as I take a look at the future, many of these can be actually automated and some of them are. So affinity analysis, you can use a software system called Mural, and it does basically the same type of thing. You know, relationship diagrams, we, we see there's software like Selenix that does those automated process systems. Uh, we see uh, we can get tree diagrams automatically formulated by relationship modeling and cluster analysis and so forth. So all of these systems are actually going to be replaced by many of the IT functions, but they will not actually substitute for the reason we have these tools. And that is we have to have integrated thinking, we have to have co coordination, we have to have scheduling that works together. And we have to be able to see how do these ideas deploy into all the different parts of the organization. Now, Henri Fayol talked about in, in his book, The um, uh, uh, General Industrial Management in, in uh, 1916, he said that, that management requires a constant search for improvements and the executive in charge should have an active, unrelenting intention to affect improvement. Jack Welch, when he was at his height uh, of capabilities in, in the 1990s, he said, the most critical obligation, obligation now, of the executive function is to deliver both profit in the short term and strength in the long term. And that means we cannot give, make decisions about profit maximization that will destroy strength over the long term. That's basically profit without compromising strength. So we see in, in the Gemba, when you go to the Gemba, 
ask what you can do them. Don't go to scold them. That's not the way of Kaizen. And the three gifts management can have is first, specific responsibility to do something. Second, dedicated resources to help them through that. Third, decisions rights that allow them to self-regulate their own capability. Maybe that's budgetary supplements and so forth to make that work. So don't go to the Gemba empty-handed. Go there with some gifts to give them. And we talk about responsibility. We're talking about the obligation to manage or control activities that are assigned to us. And we see there's new obligations of management. And so Deming made the comment, the greatest waste is failure to use the abilities of people to learn about their frustrations and about the contributions that they are eager to make. And that's why we go to the Gamba to find out what are they actually eager to make. I remember when Bill Hewlett was talking about why did he do what's called at HP management by uh, walking around, not wandering around, but walking around. And he said, I go with three hats. Hat number one, I go to discover. It's, it's, I, I'm a cheerleader. I'm, I'm encouraging them. Hat number two, I have a, another hat and I'm sort of the skeptic. I'm sort of looking at things and I'm playing the devil's advocate. Hat number three, I'm the resource provider, and I give them the things they need to do to get the job done once they've convinced me that that's what needs to be done. So we want to operationalize strategy to point. So in this system, we want to manage uh, cross-functional processes, form this linked and aligned system of work processes, create a sound measurement system that's linked to the processes and their performance, develop evidence-based approach to how we do our work, understand system integration effects of the work processes, stimulate the employee's desire to work and engage them, and establish a strategic pathway where we're gonna go based on sound measurement. So change must improve results as delivered by the system of daily management. And if we take a look at this, we start seeing that, oops, so that the strategic work that we have is that which is gonna create the system of integration and it will give us the direction that we need. And, and that's what we would like to have as this outcome. So again, uh, I have a duplicate slide there, I don't need that. Uh, so Hoshin enables uh, strategic change. And what we see is that we're adding value to processes and people. So, so we engage people as humans. We have dialogue-based communication. We have participative decision, recognizing people for results, giving them motivation to perform. And the aim is that people have joy in the work that they do. So this is increasing the value contribution of work. Now takeaways for executives are a couple. So first, executives must guide strategy to operational conclusion in the routine systems. Executives must develop and implement the plans necessary, and it's through their extension, if you will, of their executive function and delegation to do this. And executives must provide career development opportunities for workers so workers can feel advanced and then feel like they have the joy in life from what they're doing. And finally, they have to assure that profound knowledge is developed. And I, I have just one slide to close here, and then we have some time for questions. But it's goal-directed policy. And, and the Buddha said, my goal is not to be better than everyone else, but to be better than I used to be. Our destiny is not created by the shoes we wear, but by the steps, steps we take. So goal-directed policy is seeing the direction and actively taking the steps to get us there. So as, as Musashi said, step by step, walk the thousand mile road. And that's what we mean by strategy. So thank you very much. Um, Manny, do we have some questions? There are a couple of questions. Uh, we have time some for some more, but uh, let's see what we've got here. Um, uh, how about this one? Uh, Dr. Wanchin mentioned there's no word in Japanese for policy. Can you elaborate on the meaning of Hoshin and Kanri and how policy is word got translated? Well, um, Hoshin, it's combining two words, Ho and Shin. Ho means method or form comes from the derivation of soldier. So you can think of the soldier. So, so many times people think of martial arts, or you've heard about the kata. That's basically the series of moves you make in martial arts, it's method. Uh, shin is the shiny needle on a compass that allows you to see your way even in the darkest night. So, so when you put Hoshin together, it says that even when we don't know where we're going, we understand the direction and we can get there. 
Conry is, is uh, translated uh, basically as a management system. And there's several levels of Conry in an organization. So there can be Hoshin Conry, there can be Kinabetsu Conry, which is company-wide quality control, and Shitsu Conry, which is the quality management system, Nichijo Conry, Kaizen Conry, and then self-directed management is Jisu Conry. So that's what Conry means. So, so what the Japanese did, they didn't try to translate policy into one of the uh, traditional words. And so when they talked about it, they defined it as policy deployment. They use the English word. And so that's why there's, there's some concern when you talk about Hoshin Conry, it's not really just policy management. So what, what policy management, I think this has gotten confusing. It, it's really a combination of two things, a strategic component, that's this uh, strategic management by policy. And then there's the deployment component, which is the Hoshin Tenkai about how do I actually get those projects into the organization and make them work. Okay. Um, we had a, a viewer ask if you could elaborate on MBO and what that is compared to self-control. Is self-control empowering the different levels, worrying about what they're able to control? Okay, so self self-control is, is actually a, a Jisu Conry. It's it's like you are there working in the standardized work environment, the SDCA. And the question is, how do you manage yourself to the standards? How do you leave, seek improvements in that standard? And then how do you keep getting to a deeper level of engagement in your process? Okay, so that, that's this idea of self-control. And then that should happen in everybody's lifestyle, if you will. That's about the, uh, the, the principles of, of continual improvement for each individual. And that's really what we mean by Jisu Conry, this principle of self-control. When we talk okay. about MB, and when we talk about MBO, what we are talking about is how do you really run this objectives cascade in organizations? And, and so in Western organizations, um, it doesn't really link together very well always. Because what happens is sometimes the big boss says, do something. My boss comes to me and says, well, this is what the big boss said. The way I interpret it for us is this. What are you going to do? And, and so we don't really maintain the linkage. We allow everybody to sort of redefine this. And so we end up with sort of a watered down system. So, so at the time, at the end, we may not actually get the results we're looking for. And the self-control part of that is actually saying, let's stick to this alignment. At Xerox, in their process called managing for results, they used to call this line of sight. You know, so just like if you're shooting a gun at a long distance, do you have the line of sight? Can you see all the way to the target that you're going to deal with? And, and do you know what you have to do to get on target? Okay. Interesting. Um, there's a question about quality responsibility for workers. They have to improve the quality of their work. Is this related to improving standard work, eliminating waste, or doing it perfectly? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So okay. per perfection is the goal. Okay. And so workers need to see when they're not perfect, and that gives them the stimulation to improve. And standard work is the agreed upon documentation of the best way of doing things. So, so basically all three of those are combined in what's happening in that Gemba one through that SDCA cycle. Okay. Um, got a couple of interesting comments here. I mean, like the series, obviously. Um, the one that is interesting to me is what are the companies that are most successful at doing Hoshin Khan? Like, can you name companies? Um, well, I think there have been a number of companies that have been successful. Now, the, the question, anytime somebody asks this question, I'm always reluctant to answer because I can talk to a company, so I can say HP, but then they, they, they took a point of time in HP when they didn't do it well. So I can say there's a 10 year period of time at HP that was done really well. There's about an eight year period of time at Xerox where it's done really well. There was about a seven year period of time at Compact Computer where it's done well. At Nokia Mobile Phones, there was about a 10 year period of time and so forth. So the problem is, you know, if I choose a company and I talk about it, I have a particular period of time in mind. And the problem that we see in almost every organization is they don't have constancy of purpose. And so, yeah, there are periods of time where they were running and then all of a sudden 
they had a change. It could be externally imposed or it could be internally with a new CEO. And then things went to hell in a handbasket, so to speak. So it just went totally awry. So, so um, yeah, so those are companies that I, I had direct experience where it worked. And, and I know there's a number of companies that I'm working with right now that, that have ocean stuff. I don't want to talk about them because it can be a competitive advantage to them. Uh, but those are all historical cases where we saw long-term periods of, of companies actually performing very well. If you go into Japan, we can start naming others that have even longer periods. So, uh, I mean, uh, Komatsu and, and uh, to, uh, Toyota and Toshiba, um, uh, Yokogawa Hewlett Packard, for instance, uh, Rico, all of those companies have Hoshin Connery systems that have been operating for, for more than 10 years. Now you expect that because it's Japan, but I mean, that's true. So, so there, there are a lot of companies where it's working. And then there are other companies that have their unique process. So what we talk about here, it's a, a generic process, but Kyocera has a different process for this. And Kyocera is considered one of the most innovative companies in Japan, but they use what's called amoeba management. So, so I mean, when we talk about Hoshin Kong, let's not make this monolithic one style fits all. What the Japanese do is encourage every organization to create their own system for their culture, their business, and then to make it their own so the people are committed to it. Okay. Well, I see we're over time, but there's still a lot of people here. So um, maybe we take another question or two. Sure, that's fine. Okay. Um, somebody said, I see that executives are not able to set up a strategic plan, implement a catch ball process that involves middle management. What is your experience? What do you advise to overcome that obstacle? Well, I think most of the reason is I don't think any executive can do those things. What the executive has to do is they have to get themselves surrounded with people who can facilitate those things. So it's like, who is going to be the facilitator of the Hoshin Connery? The CEO? No, he's got other things to do. You know, is the, the uh, uh, chief strategy officer? No, he's looking at content. You know, what are the things we have to do? So who is going to manage the strategy process in an organization? And in Japan, that's really where the corporate TQM office is operating. So in, in the U.S. system, it may be your chief quality officer, or maybe it's a master black belt, somebody who is a trusted advisor to the executive that they, they know that they will do a good job in putting that system together and managing that system. And I think this is actually, as I look forward to the future with Quality 4.0, and we start seeing shifts happening in quality jobs, I see this as becoming more and more important. So that person will have to be not only process savvy, but also technology savvy measurement system savvy they'll have to understand predictive analytics how it all fits together and, and right now i think the only people who could do that in most organizations are the senior quality officers okay um somebody else wrote we'll take one more question now um i heard sony used x matrix as part of ocean connery they do Can you elaborate on that sure they're, they're the one uh most public case on it so Sony, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, the Fukuda, I, I think, was wrote the book on X matrices in 1997. He came out of Sony. Now, Sony's never won a Deming Prize, for instance, so they're, they're not really in the Juice organization. They're not part of the TQM organization. So they actually have their own approach. And, and I would not call that really mainline Hoshin Conrad. Now, there are other organizations who do use X matrices. They're one of the management planning tools, or matrices are in general. And so it's not that other organizations don't use them, but the cumbersomeness, I find, of the X matrix is not good for communicating to workers what they need to do or how you get there. And I find it very confusing. Very similar to the X matrix is also what this must-win battle is that came out of IMD. And what I see is that when you, you go through that system, at the bottom, you end up with 100 maybe implementing projects. And you've lost the focus of the major change initiatives. And I think that's really bad. So in, in, in many of the, the organizations I've looked at, your Hoshin is a one-page plan. And what you have below that is, is your implementation plans. So this is the implementation plan for this project. And that's what you're managing. So that this cascading of all of these forms or, or moving them around and so forth 
it's not necessary because the, the secret of a well-designed host system is its simplicity. Okay. Well, I see we're five minutes after the top of the hour, so I think we should probably cut this off now. But thank you, Dr. Watson. I think this has been a great um, series. And for anybody who wants to see the previous series, they're on YouTube. If you go to ASQ's uh, LED channel on YouTube, then you can uh, access them and lots of other things too. So. And so many, I just want to thank you for your support and for hosting these and for everyone for coming and listening. So thank you all. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. It has been my pleasure. And um, I'm kind of hoping to see your next series. <laughs> well, it's under debate right now with the new incoming publication chair. So for oh. LED. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So. All right, folks. Okay. This is another wonderful episode. Thank you very much, Dr. Watson. Really do appreciate you sharing your knowledge. And uh, for the folks that, that are still here, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. All right. Take care. Good night. Yes. Uh, yes.